The periodic table is more than just a list of the elements. It's a scientific roadmap. It's also one of the most important tools for scientists in a wide range of fields, from chemistry to quantum mechanics. Hi, I'm Rich Burnett for Wondrium. In this episode of Perspectives, three scientists discuss how the periodic table came to be and some interesting ways it can be used to predict how the world works. We begin now with a brief look at the periodic table years before it took its familiar shape. Enjoy. The periodic table is much more than just a reference tool for chemists. It's also a history book that tells a history of discoveries as well as what we've made of those discoveries. If you look closely at the table's evolution over the past 150 years, you'll find that the names, symbols, positions of elements, and even the shape of the table itself have all changed in various ways. And each of these updates captures a story of discovery, scientific achievement, human ambition, and sometimes even global politics. This is why the periodic table is one of the most iconic images in all of science. It is so much more than just a listing of all 118 known elements. It's a table of contents for the rich and much larger story of our constantly evolving understanding of matter. By 1860, about 60 chemical elements were known, enough for scientists to start organizing them. The first person to recognize that there was a repetition in the properties of the elements was the French geologist Alexandre de Chancourtois. Unfortunately, de Chancourtois used a lot of geology terminology, and his contributions were missed by the chemists at the time. In 1864, English chemist John Newlands grouped the known elements into 11 groups and, noting that the weights differed by multiples of 8, proposed a law of octaves based on an analogy to musical scales. This wasn't appreciated very much by his contemporary colleagues, though, and it wasn't until over 60 years later that a variation of his law of octaves gained some experimental support. In 1864, German chemist Julius Lothar Meyer published a chart of elements, but it included less than half of the known elements, and so has been found wanting by science historians. No, the big breakthrough came in 1869, when Russian chemist Dmitry Mendeleev published a chart of the elements that was the first version of the modern periodic table. But Mendeleev did something that no one else did. He left gaps in his chart if an element didn't fit the correct progression of chemical properties. His excuse? Perhaps these elements hadn't been discovered yet, and based on the properties of other elements around them, Mendeleev predicted some of the chemical and physical properties of these missing elements. A bold move, but Mendeleev was right. Six years later, the element gallium was discovered, and it had almost exactly the same properties that Mendeleev predicted. Not long after that, a new element, scandium, and another, germanium, were discovered, and their properties agreed very well with Mendeleev's predictions. For these reasons, Mendeleev is more generally considered the inventor of the periodic table rather than Meyer. Now, the secret to the ability of Mendeleev's table to group elements with similar properties so long ago is that those properties he used, atomic mass and valence, are closely related to certain features of atomic structure, specifically atomic number and the structure of the electron cloud that drive the organization of the table today. This graphical organization of the elements based on their fundamental structure has stunning power to bring together similar elements. Precious metals like silver, platinum, and gold cluster in one region. Essential nutrients, sodium, potassium, and calcium cluster together. Sharing the first period are hydrogen and helium, which are the primary players in the nuclear reactions that power our sun. The iron and nickel that make up most of our planet's core are close neighbors. Even the elements most essential to life, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, 
phosphorus, and sulfur cluster together in their own tidy group of nonmetals near the top right corner. And there's so much more. Each element's place on the table is determined by its atomic structure, and an atom's structure influences its properties. The table's systematic organization of elements in terms of their atoms offers to share tremendous insights when it comes to the abundance, distribution, and properties of the elements and compounds in the world around us. Now, here's an interesting fact. Almost all chemistry happens because of valence electrons. When you think about it, it makes sense. The valence electrons are farthest away from the nucleus, so they're the inner electrons that can interact with other atoms. Almost all chemistry is valence electrons. In the first two columns of the table, the valence electrons are always going to be S subshells. We call the first two columns the S block of the periodic table. On the right side, the six columns that are the valence electrons going into P subshells. We therefore call this the P block of the periodic table. Similarly, we have the D block, and the F block is that section that we usually break away and place underneath the rest of the blocks. These labels emphasize our understanding of the subshell nature for the table shape. Okay, now that we're in a safe place where we can observe these reactions or these properties of alkali metals, I've secured three of them for us to look at. I have lithium metal, which is from the second row of the periodic table. I have sodium metal, which is from the third row, and potassium metal, which comes from the fourth row of the periodic table. Now, each one has just one valence electron that it's going to lose in a reaction with water to form hydrogen gas, which is flammable, what's called a hydroxide ion, which we're going to detect using a very special compound called an indicator. Essentially, it's going to turn red when these hydroxide ions form in solution. But of course, what we're really out to observe is the formation of the ions of these three that take place during the reaction. And even more specifically, just how vigorously these reactions take place. Because we've already predicted, based upon the periodic table's own structure, that we should see a trend in exactly how rapidly and violently these reactions take place. So let's get started with lithium. And you can see the solution is beginning to turn reddish, an indication that we're making hydroxide. And there's also obviously a gas forming, and that's hydrogen gas, it's effervescing. But also you'll notice by the end of the reaction that that lithium chunk will be gone, because it's no longer lithium metal. It's now lithium-1 ions dissolved into solution. Here we go. Now here you can see that the reaction is going more vigorously. In fact, so vigorously that the heat it generates has melted the sodium metal, and it's actually a little ball of sodium metal now that's dancing around on the surface of the water. Oh, there we go, and that little bit of hydrogen gas ignited right at the end. Evidence that we are, in fact, conducting the reaction that we believe we are. Okay, here is potassium. All right. Now, regardless of what you may have thought of the sodium and lithium reactions, I think we can all agree that this reaction was far more violent. Right? Same exact reaction. The only difference was that our alkali metals came from different rows of the periodic table, a periodic trend. The d-block region of the table is also sometimes casually referred to as the transition metals. So how did that name come about? Well, in 1919, Irving Langmuir published the famous paper entitled The Arrangement of Electrons in Atoms and Molecules. And in his paper, Langmuir asserted that each principal energy level must feel completely before the next is populated. But in 1921, English chemist Charles Bury published a paper challenging Langmuir's postulate. He proposed that certain properties of elements in what he called the long periods could be better explained if elements did indeed start to place electrons in a higher energy level, then transition back into filling an interior shell with even more electrons. Bury suggested that this was exactly what was happening in elements from scandium to zinc, and he was right. 
those elements have switched to a transitional process of filling an interior energy level with electrons before getting back to filling their outer shell. Some of my favorite colors are produced by transition metals. I'll never forget the day in chemistry class that we did an experiment with the different oxidation states of cobalt. And in the same test tube, we produced several different oxidation states that ranged in color from pink to purple to blue. It was beautiful. The transition metals are in the very middle of the periodic table, and when we count the number of electrons that these metals have, we see that they have partially filled D shells. If you have a hunk of pure metal like silver or copper or gold, it usually looks shiny because of all of the metallic electrons. But when you take a transition metal and put it inside of an insulating chemical compound, one that's not shiny or metallic, the colors that we see in this case are dominated by those D shell electrons in the transition metal ion. And it's transitions within these D shells that cause the beautiful colors. They're responsible for the many different colors of soda lime glass, gems and minerals, and pigments that get used in a variety of applications, including paint. The exact color that's produced will depend on exactly which visible colors are absorbed by the pigment. That's mostly going to depend on which transition metal is used and what its oxidation state is, that is, how many electrons the metal has given up to the surrounding compound that it's in. Let's look at a specific example to see how this goes. Corundum is a mineral made of aluminum and oxygen. Its chemical composition is aluminum 2, oxygen 3. Pure corundum is colorless. But if you take colorless corundum and add a little bit of the transition metal chromium to the mix, then you get a lovely red ruby. In a ruby crystal, Roughly every 200th aluminum atom has been replaced with a chromium atom. It's the quantum transitions that the electrons make within the chromium ions that give ruby its beautiful red color. The bottom line is that chromium in this context ends up having three electrons in its D shell. They can then have transitions among those D levels that are the right energy to pull some of the photons out of our visible range. One of those transitions happens at 556 nanometers, which is yellow that's slightly on the greener side. The other transition that's in the visible range happens at 400 nanometers, which is violet. So imagine now white light shining on this ruby crystal. Those chromium ions are going to take away the greenish yellow light, and they're going to take away the violet light through absorption, which causes transitions of their D shell electrons. That means that what gets reflected back to our eyes and also what transmits through the crystal is just whatever light is left and doesn't get absorbed. That's mostly going to be red light, along with just a little bit of blue. So this is responsible for the overall brilliant red color of the ruby. Although many transition elements are indeed capable of making beautiful colored compounds when combined with other elements, molybdenum and its neighbors on the table are probably best known for their uses as pure metals or alloys in engineering and construction. Molybdenum is one of the hardest metals with one of the highest known melting points. And the strange fact that it was named using a Greek word for lead is because one of its common compounds, molybdenum sulfide, was known to have soft properties that resembled actual lead. The strong trend of increasing melting points and density is clear as we descend from chromium to molybdenum to tungsten. Now, the latter two are well known for their durability and use in high temperature applications like lighting, where tungsten filaments can literally be heated to white-hot temperatures and still remain a solid. But tungsten's position in the sixth period also gives it awesome density. At 19 grams per cubic centimeter, it rivals that of uranium. Now, thankfully, tungsten has two stable isotopes. This means that tungsten can be used, for example, to forge conventional military munition projectiles with density and hardness of so-called depleted uranium. 
but without the radiological, toxicological, and environmental challenges that depleted uranium poses. Many modern armor-piercing munitions are made partially or even completely of tungsten. Now, whether you need a material with high density and heat resistance, lightweight and durability, or even a splash of color, the early transition metals with their allocation of available D-subshell electrons are just the ticket. So does the periodic table have any final upper limit? From a nucleus perspective, it's hard to say. But the physicist Richard Feynman is said to have predicted that the story of the periodic table might end at element 137. Not because of unstable nuclei, but because calculations predict that electrons orbiting such a nucleus would have to exceed the speed of light just to stay in orbit. More recent estimates that take relativistic effects into account have suggested there may be room to fill an eighth row that goes all the way to element 172. Now the truth is, we really don't know where the limit is, which is one of the great things about the practice of science, if you've asked me. A final question is, why keep going? Why spend many thousands or even millions of dollars on the quest to make a single atom of a completely alien substance? No, well, why indeed? The practical response to this question is always to cite the island of stability and the possibility that someday humanity will make a stable super heavy element with all new properties for us to study and exploit for our benefit. But another compelling reason is the same that any scientist in any field would offer. Because we don't know what we don't know. And wouldn't it be a shame to miss out on a world-changing discovery just because we lacked the understanding to predict that it'd be there? And it makes sense to keep going precisely because of how much knowledge is already embodied in the periodic table. An awesome tool to guide us on our exploration of matter and the universe. Hey, thanks for watching. If you'd like to learn more about the topics in this episode, the full list of series that these clips came from is in the description below. You can watch them all on Wondrium. And don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel for new episodes of Perspectives, and you can watch previous ones here.